This is going to be a little bit longer study than normal, but we're going to go through some things. The first thing we're going to talk about is obeying the truth. When you're girding up your loins with truth to do the work of truth and to fight with, for truth, in order to do those two things, you've got to obey truth. You have to train yourself to obey the truth and fight for it. Okay? John 14, 23 reads, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. True love for Jesus Christ is keeping his word. That's why Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. He's going to give you the truth, and you're going to start keeping it, and people are not going to be happy about it. People aren't going to like it. You're going to have neighbors that don't like you. I have neighbors that don't like me. Uh, family members that don't like you. You're going to start you know, losing friends that you used to have when you were lost. You were great friends when you were lost, but when you got saved, what happened? You drifted apart. Why? Because you have nothing in common. John 15, 12 reads, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Okay. Remember what it says? If a man love me, he will keep my words. If you love one another as I have loved you, I understand it talks about doing right by one another, but preaching truth to one another is loving one another. It's true love for one another is preaching truth. Okay. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. That's true love. Is when a man lay down his life for his friend. 14. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. There was that saying that says, Will God save anybody he cannot command? Will Jesus save anybody that he cannot command? Well, what we just read there basically says, because people always keep saying that Jesus died, present tense, personally, individually, for every person out there. No, he didn't. He died for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. The first command is obey the gospel. Okay? I learned the Bible version issue. Then God showed me the gospel. Obey the gospel. Gird up your loins with truth. Absolute truth. Okay, But right here we're talking about God. Jesus is telling us as soldiers for Jesus Christ, you've got to take orders. You've got to take commands. Okay? If a man love me, he will keep my words. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. Anybody can be the friend of Jesus Christ. That offer is out there. When we get to the, uh, breath, uh, the feet shot of the preparation of peace, the ministry of reconciliation, anybody can be the friend of Jesus Christ. But if someone dies rejecting Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, and they die in their sins, and they go to hell, Jesus didn't die for them. They will have to stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne and they will have to answer for their sins and pay for their sins for all eternity. Get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. But that offer's out there. I just want to throw that out there because people keep getting on to me for that verse because how I interpret it and everything. No, it says it plain out there. Greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friend. The Ministry of Reconciliation, and I'm going off a little bit, but the Ministry of Reconciliation is you're reconciling, trying to get people to be reconciled to God. Right now you're the enemy of God. And we go out there and preach the plan of salvation, the true plan of salvation, the gospel of peace, to reconcile people to Jesus Christ so you're no longer an enemy, you're now a friend. Now you're one of those people that Jesus died for. But to obey the truth, you got to take commands. Do whatsoever I command you. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's one command. We already talked about another. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a command. There's lots of commands in this Bible that when you first start out, I always told people, when I first got saved, my life was a mess. God had a lot of work to do on me. And it doesn't happen overnight. But it does happen. And God gets, my, gets your life cleaned up and says, okay, my word commands, do this. My command, don't do that. My command, stay away from that. My command, you need to cling to this, cling to that which is, which is good, the Bible says. Okay. The question is, is, why can't people do this? Why can't people gird up their loins with truth? 
follow God's commands. I mean, it's also another way to spot counterfeits. Romans chapter 10, verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? When you get saved and you gird up your loins with truth, which is the first step, and you start putting on that whole armor of God, and you start going through boot camp, God, God sends you through basic training, the milk, and then you start getting the meat, you start getting out there and start doing the work for the Lord, and you start getting out there and fighting for the Lord, it's going to lead to a changed life. But you have people that don't want to change life. They don't want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Basically what they're saying is, I don't want to be a soldier for Jesus Christ. They don't want to gird up their loins. Okay. What's going on? They, don't, they have not all obeyed the gospel. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. So what, that, what happens is, is they have uh, what we talked about in the intro. Uh, they're all putting on Saul's armor. It's not proven. doesn't fit. It's, it's counterfeit armor to try to look like a soldier, to look like a Christian. They like to put on a good show. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 reads, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There we see it again. They didn't obey the, Lord, the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. God does the saving. His grace is what saves. And He does the saving. After He saves you, you are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's the true gospel. And people like to take repentance out or they'll pervert what repentance is. I've heard so many people pervert what repentance is. Okay? It's when God repents, it's a change of mind. Okay? When man repents, it's a change of heart, but it's sorrow for that wrong that they did to somebody. When it comes to salvation, it's sin. It's this, you have a sorrow for the sin that you committed towards God. You can have repentance towards a brother in Christ because you wronged somebody, but you have sorrow for wronging them. Okay, I repent. The Bible says, if you repent, forgive him. I'm talking about a brother in Christ. When man repents, it has to do with the heart. And it has to do with sorrow for how you did something, how you treated someone. With God, it's disobeying God. That's why the Bible says God is not like man that he should repent. He's talking about God's repentance isn't the same repentance as the way man repents. There are two different repentance there. And people keep getting them confused. They always keep saying change of mind, change of mind, change of mind. No, it's a change of heart for man. Okay. You wrong somebody and you're happy about it and now you have sorrow about it. It's a change of heart. No, no, it's a change of mind, it's a change of mind, it's a change of heart, okay? For godly sorrow worketh repentance. That's what makes repentance works as it applies to salvation. Whether eternal salvation, because it starts at salvation, like when you get saved, or salvation in this life. Okay, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Whether it's salvation in this life or your eternal salvation, it requires godly sorrow to make that repentance work. I always tell people repentance starts at salvation and continues until the catching away of the body of Christ or until you die and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a process that starts at salvation. When you've got people that take that out of salvation, they're not obeying the gospel. They like the old man, they like the old woman, they want to keep the old man, the old woman. They're not girding up their loins with truth because the truth isn't in them. The Bible talks about that. I don't know if I have that verse down. John 8, 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. They haven't obeyed the gospel. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They, they're, they're not girding up their loins with truth. Okay. No Holy Spirit in them. No the Jesus Christ in them. And they don't have God's word in their heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you obey the gospel, repentance, and you start girding up your loins with truth, you're going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Galatians 6.15 reads, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision but a new creature. 
no change life gospel equals <laughs> is a no resurrection gospel. I had so many people attack me um, when I did that study, uh, making videos against it, because I said the Bible teaches that you're supposed to be uh, crucified. The old man is crucified with Christ. When you come to the cross and you throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross, and you repent, having godly sorrow towards God for those sins that you're throwing at the foot of the cross. I didn't say cleaning up your life. This is all happening in the heart. You're throwing iniquity at the foot of the cross, and you're asking God to save you. Okay? It's going to lead to a changed life. But the old man is crucified with Christ when you do that. Then the new man is, Lord, I want to please you. I want to love you. If a man loves me, he'll keep my words. I want to be your friend, which means do whatsoever I command you. Lord, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Tell me how to live my life, I'm going to live it. Tell me what I need to get rid of, and so on and so forth. There's a changed life. Why is it people can't seem to gird up their loins with truth? Because oftentimes they're not saved. They try to hold on to the old man, the old woman. They try to, they try to mess something up with the plan of salvation, the true gospel. They'll take repentance out. Or they'll change the definition of repentance. They'll take prayer out. Okay. And they'll mess up the plan of salvation. How to find God's grace so God saves you that leads to a changed life. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Next one that we're going to talk about, that's obeying the truth. You've got to obey the truth. And then the truth here is, is going to show you the gospel, which it did me. And I got saved and God started helping me. Give me a second. Ugh. Victoria wants to, uh, this is a long study, but Victoria wanted to get out and get some water, my mentor schnauzer. The next one we talk about is, okay, you've got to obey truth. You're girding up your loins so you can do the work of the Lord, and you can uh, fight for the Lord, and there's the change life that's going on while you're doing this. Uh, you got to obey the truth. Now, we're going to talk about, well, now you want to do the work of the truth. We're going to talk about it again, 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach, oh, that's the next one, okay, but first, 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. We all want to do the work of the Lord. I've seen people like, I just I really want to preach the word, I want to fellowship, I want to you know, hand out gospel tracts and stuff and whatnot. You just really want to do the work of the Lord. Okay, grow up your loins with truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's always going to come to that, down to that. Okay, the reason I mention this verse again, I was taught the best ways to study this book right here is you can do word studies. Words have meaning. Okay. Uh, it's not Trinity, it's Godhead. It's not Rapture, it's caught up. You know what I'm saying? When you start doing studies, you start realizing all these words and phrases that don't, you won't find it in Scripture. You start realizing why you used to say them, because they're part of false beliefs. Okay? Paganism. They don't line up with Scripture. Okay? But you've got word studies. Words have meaning. You can do a word study. What that means is, is you just you turn and say, okay, I'm going to look up the word filthiness. I'm just looking at the, what are the words here. Filthiness. And I'm going to look up every word that it's mentioned in the Bible, and I'm just going to go from verse to verse that it's mentioned in and get the context of it's mentioned in, and that's a study. That's one way to study. The other way to study is subject study. Okay? I want to look at anywhere where it talks about... Uh, I want to do a subject study on, as a Christian today, how we're supposed to give thanks. You're not necessarily looking up the word thank, or like thanks or thank you, but how one gives thanks. You're supposed to give God thanks in all things. And, you know, have a good attitude, you know. But there's subject studies where you look up a specific subject, like Godhead. That's a subject. Uh, eternal security. That's a subject. These are subjects that you're going to go all throughout the Bible, uh, and you're going to try to you know link things together. But that's a subject study. So you got word study. You got subject study. The third one is called a um, expository study. 
And that's where, you, right here, I'm, Ephesians 5, verse 1, you just start going through, and anytime you hit something, you, you go, you can, with an expository study, it's the same thing as a, it's putting a subject study and a word study into the fact that your main focus is on that chapter that you're going through. So you're going through this chapter, and it talks about um, who hath loved us, Christ who hath loved us. And then you go over here, for God so loved the world, John 3.16. You know, you go over there, okay, that lines up with this. Then you keep going down to the next verse, and you find out anything else that lines up with it. And then the next verse, and the next verse. It's called an expository study. You're just going verse by verse and, re and comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay. So doing the work of the truth when you're girding up your loins. Word studies, subject studies, expository studies. Okay. Now the other thing that I, I almost want to throw in there as a study too is, is instruction and righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Instruction and righteousness can fall under word studies and subject studies, but there's times where you're going to come across something that's like abstain from all appearance of evil, and what you do instead with that study is you start looking in your life and saying, am I abstaining from all appearance of evil? That doesn't look right. What does the Bible say about that? Okay, it, it is evil. I need to get rid of it. Oh, I'm just, you know, it's not the wrong. I'm just saying, and then there could be the scenario where there's nothing wrong with it, but there might have been, but I'm glad I looked at it. God showed me something. You learned something. Okay. Uh, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. When you're girding up your loins with truth, you're sanctifying yourself to living a life of truth. I'm going to walk in truth. Remember, when you gird up that loin, that uh, allows you to walk. You can run, you can jump, you can fight, you can do a lot of heavy lifting and everything. Get a lot of heavy lifting to get a lot of that junk out of your life when you're newly saved, because there's going to be a lot of sin and wickedness in your life. Psalms 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Heed. Okay. Whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're girding up your loins with truth. It's not just in words, but it's in action. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If you want to be someone that's out there can be preaching the word and be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering doctrine, you've got to hide God's word in your heart. You've got to do a lot of study. You've got to apply a lot of what you learn and God shows you to your life, to your walk. 1 Peter 3 4 reads, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible. Even the or ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of God of great price. Okay. You're supposed to have the capital W word in your heart and the lowercase w word in your heart. I just put that in there. I, that's what the verse when I was mentioning it earlier. The hidden man of the heart. The Holy Spirit's got to be in your heart, which is Jesus in your heart. Okay. That's the, it's, I could go into it. It's the Godhead. They're one and the same. Okay. Have, you know, the body, soul, and spirit, that's the distinction, but... When it says, Jesus says, I will be with you, and then he talks about the Holy Spirit being with you, it's Jesus with you. What he hears, that shall he speak, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But you need to have the Holy Spirit in you, and you need to have God's Word in you, in your heart. You want to do the work of, the, of, the, of truth? Get to studying. Get to applying it to your life. That's how you start living for the Lord. You gird up your loins with truth and you start walking. Okay. The next thing you do is when you start doing the work of truth, first you've got to obey the truth. You've got to get that mindset in your heart that you believe this is God's perfect written word and you have to have that heartfelt desire that, Lord, you command me and I obey. And when you get that in your head and in your heart, that's when you start doing the work. You start doing the study and God starts showing you things. Then you get to the point where you start standing for truth. It starts showing in your life, it starts reflecting in your life, that you're standing for truth. It's not just words, it's also indeed. First, I want to be, do a quick warning when you're standing for truth, to be careful not to get drawn into debates, whisperings, backbitings, etc. Okay? 
The Bible's not for that. I know there's been some brethren, like Peter Ruckman used to debate some people and stuff like that. The Bible's not for it. Okay. Why? Because you have the two people up there debating, and you've got the crowd, and there can be a newly saved Christian in the crowd that gets confused. That can be deceived. People can be pulled in the wrong direction. Okay. Uh, you only speak truth, and you try to tell people, okay, when you find out that that person's not speaking truth, it's not about debating. There's nothing wrong with discussing the Word of God and correcting one another. Remember what we read up there. Uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Okay? There's nothing wrong with doing those three things. But you don't get into debate with the lost world about the Word of God. Okay? Romans 1.29. Turn to Romans 1.29. And we are going to read to 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, whispers, backbiters, that's all the words I was mentioning. Whispering is, has to do with gossip. You're just spreading rumors and lies. Okay? Backbiting is you just, you're just talking negative about people left and right. I've fallen into the trap of backbiting before. Okay? Um, haters of God. I always stop at that one because it's like, I, you start talking with someone about the Word of God and about absolute truth. You're girding up your loins of truth. You start talking to some people online. You start realizing, wait a second, they act like they love God, but they're really haters of God. You know, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. You're like, there's some people I've talked to just by the time I'm done with them, like, they have no love for the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. When I'm out in public handing out gospel tracts sometimes, I come across people that, oh, I love Jesus, and you get there to talk to them about the real Jesus. They hate the real Jesus. They don't love the, real, the haters of God. Okay? Jesus, who is, capital G, God, the Father, fully and completely God. You have those Trinity group that they, they're haters of God. Singular. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant, bre covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, here's the point, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Do you like watching debates? Well, I wouldn't debate myself, but I love watching debates. You're just as guilty. Well, I, I don't I don't like I don't think people should gossip. But did you hear this about so and so? If you're doing it, you're guilty. But if you're sitting there listening to it and you don't say anything, you're just as guilty. If you hear people gossiping and you don't go to correct them and say, hey, that's called gossip. And that's a sin. If you sit there and you enjoy hearing it, I didn't, I didn't say it, and I didn't spread it around, but you love hearing it, you're just as guilty. Okay? But when you're standing for truth, be careful. The main parts in there was debate and whispering and backbiting. They'll try to get you into fights. You know, drama. There's a lot of drama going around. Uh, the Bible says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. Let them alone. Give them to the Lord. The Lord will deal with them. The Lord will take care of them. Okay? 2 Corinthians 12.9 reads, Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in, in Christ. There's the Holy Spirit again. In Christ. But we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. When you get drawn into debates, whisperings, and backbiting, and arguments, that's not edifying to the body of Christ. Be careful, don't get drawn in, I'm sorry, don't get drawn into making videos if you're a brother in Christ in, in ministry where it becomes about, you know, debates, I know, uh, backbiting and, and whatnot and arguing. It's just not edifying. Dearly beloved, for, the, for your edifying, that's what we're here for. Remember what we said up there, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. It edifies the body of Christ when you do that. 
For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I should be found unto you such as you would not. There was a lot of whispering going on about Paul, a lot of uh, lies, you know, people starting rumors and stuff. Lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swelling, tumults. It's good to do a word study on all those words. It's really good to do one at a time. Okay, These are not edifying to the body of Christ to do any of these tumults. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. All right. There's more to this, understand, but if you look at all that, debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbiting, whispering, swelling, to it's lasciviousness, it's uncleanness, it has to do with the flesh. It's not spirit, it's flesh. So my, my warning to you, brothers and sisters Christ, when you're girding up your loins with truth, be careful that when you're standing for truth, you're not getting drawn into that kind of stuff. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You're just to preach the word. If they don't want the word, fine. Go to somebody who does. If they don't want the word, fine. Now, I understand for some of the brethren, we, we feel... If, when you get to a point where you're a pastor or a preacher or a bishop, a deacon, an elder, um, head covering, that you're supposed to warn people about wolves in sheep's clothing. Absolutely. But remember, you're addressing the saved sinner, not the lost person, not the wolf in sheep's clothing, not his followers. Okay? You're addressing saved sinners. That's edifying to the body of Christ. When you forget who you're addressing and you start addressing all those lost people out there and the wolf in sheep's clothing himself and everything, you're no longer edifying the body of Christ, you're edifying your flesh. Elevating your flesh. You're getting into all those things that we just listed there. Okay, That's the warning I want to give. Gird up your loins with truth. There's fighting for the Lord, but you're fighting with for the brethren, with the brethren, and for the Lord Jesus Christ, because we are the body of Christ. Okay? You're fighting for Jesus Christ, but we are part of the body of Christ. We all have the Holy Spirit in us. You know? So, I can't say it enough to be careful. I, I don't know how many times when I was newly saved that I got drawn into arguments and debates and backbiting and whatnot, and it's like and you start getting into it, watching the videos where this person attacks that person, that person attacks this person, and they just go back and forth, and you start getting it. You don't want to get into that. The Word of God. Just live the Word of God, okay? Read the Word of God every day. Believe in the Word of God. Apply it to your life, and do Bible studies and listen to Bible studies. But be careful not to get into all that backbiting, okay? I just don't, I, there's a lot of times, even with brothers in Christ, I won't watch some videos because it's just, there's just too much backbiting going on. They're not lost. I don't believe they're, uh, you know, anybody who does a backbiting video is lost. I'm just saying they get trapped in it and you get to watch it and it's like, well, this isn't, really isn't that edifying. And it isn't. Right? You got to be careful about that. Right? We are to set the example. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You are a representative of Jesus Christ. You are a soldier for Jesus Christ. You're part of the ministry of reconciliation for Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to set the example, brothers and sisters of Christ, of what a Christian is supposed to be. Okay. The name calling, I try not. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I think this person is ignorant of Scripture. Okay. Jesus used name calling as far as, you know, snakes, serpents, du their double tongue, the double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. You know, they're double tongue. They say one thing, they do another, so they call that person a snake. I understand that to a point, but be very careful. Okay? We're representatives of Jesus Christ. 
If we get out there and start acting like them and looking like them and just name calling and everything, and you're, you're setting a poor example. Okay. When I did the in intro video for this study, I warned you that there's so many different armors out there that that's how you can tell the difference between people. We, the, the type of armor with the colors, they, they call it the colors, and there would be also um, the design. Whether it would be on your shield, on the flag that you carried, sometimes the tunic. It would determine who you fought for and who you represented and who you were with. Okay? The same thing goes for a Christian when it comes to putting on the whole armor of God. You're a representative of Jesus Christ. Okay? You need to act accordingly. Live accordingly. Speak accordingly. Right? And that's how we can tell a lot of fakes and frauds when they're not wearing the armor of God according to the scriptures. They're not wearing our, the same colors as we are, in other words. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Stop for a second. Please understand, we're in this body of flesh. I still sin sometimes. I still fail the Lord. I still fail you guys sometimes, brothers and sisters of Christ. I still struggle and I'm still warring with this flesh. Okay? But there'll come a day when I don't have to fight this body anymore. I won't be having to fight the lost world anymore. Okay? I won't have to be dealing with them. Praise the Lord. Verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us, who's the us there? Saved sinners. The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord. It always comes back to being through Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. He's the head. It starts with Jesus. It ends with Jesus. Why some people can't get that? Well, because they're not saved. But brothers in Christ, sometimes even a saved sinner can start to lose sight of that. It starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We know what we got to look forward to. We're soldiers. We've, the victory's already been won. But we're still supposed to fight for the Lord, and we're still supposed to do the work of the Lord today. We've already, Jesus already won. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible talks about how we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our soul is in our body, and it's in heaven right now. Heavenly places. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're created in Christ Jesus. You represent Jesus Christ. Remember, be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. When you gird up your loins with truth, going back to the soldier, you're going to have a post that you're standing at. You're going to have to be steadfast. You need to stand here and you don't move. You're guarding this. You're guarding this absolute truth. Okay. Unmovable. You don't just, oh, I, I want to take a break. I'm going to walk away. Or I'm going to go do my own thing. Oh, this isn't funny. We're going to do a thing. It's supposed to be unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. There's times where you have to fight for this. Someone tries to mess this up. you got to fight for it and, and, and put it right. This is truth. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, that phrase right there, that phrase, uh, that verse there, I'm sorry, I know I'm going to upset some people, but truth divides and truth upsets people. 
But Ephesians 2.10, when you talk to someone who's saved, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In them. They're going to be like, praise the Lord. When God saved me, created in Christ Jesus, he, he got my life and he cleaned it up. He got, he got porn out of my life. He got video games, movies, TV shows. Uh, I still struggle sometimes with the video games and the TV shows. Uh, but God's got a lot of it out of my life. The lying. He's got a lot of this junk out of my life. At my house, I can walk through my house now. He's got a lot of sinful, visual sinful stuff out of my life. I've gone through my books, got rid of bad books. Gone through anything that statues that were bad, paintings that were bad. He got all this bad music out of my life. Praise the Lord. That's the attitude of someone who's saved, born again. Now what happens when you hit somebody up with that and they come back to you and their response is, they get stuck on that word that says, should. It, no, it just says that we should walk in them. It just says should. You don't have to, it just says should. Is that coming from somebody who's saved? No. I'm sorry, brother and sister Christ, I've talked and listened to testimonies of a lot of people. And those who are truly saved, born again, praise the Lord for changing their life. Praise the Lord for getting all that wickedness out of their life. They don't justify sin. And if they're still struggling with certain sins, their head is held down going, yes, I'm work the Lord's working on me, and oh, I hate this sin, and it's just, I need to walk right. I need to be unto good works, like that passage. That's their attitude. That's their heartfelt. But you get those people, it's like, no, no, it says should, and they get stuck on the word should. That's a red flag, brother and sister in Christ. That's somebody that's not putting on the whole armor of God. Not girding up their loins with truth. They always do this, should, you know. I forgot the other, there's another verse. Um, uh, for we created in Christ Jesus and two good works. Uh, but there's other verses where it says something like, oh, that we should walk in newness of life. It says we should walk in newness of life. And they get stuck on the word should. I forgot where that's at. But they get stuck on the word should walk in newness of life. Uh, someone who's truly saved and born again is going to go, uh, I am going to be walking in newness of life. But you know what that should is? There's times I'm going to fail the Lord and fall flat on my face. And that time that that should applies, it's not justified. Lord, forgive me. Repent, forsake, move on. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and get back to serving Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ. That's the attitude of someone who's saved and born again. The attitude of these lost people who the old woman and the old man is still alive, they always put out the should, should, should. The should is there to show that we are still sinners. We're still in this body of flesh. You're going to be fighting and warring with this body of flesh till the day you die. Or until the praise of Praise the Lord if He comes and gets us saved sometime soon. Uh, the, the caught up, the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay, That's the difference. It's a red flag when someone keeps going, it says should, it says should. You're not saved if that's all you're focusing is on the should and not the unto good works that were created in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. That old man is dead and buried. Praise the Lord. Crucified with Christ. The new man has been raised with Jesus Christ. I did that study and the whole point of that study was this. People can profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. I believe in the resurrection, but the life that they're living denies the resurrection. If there's no new creature in Christ Jesus, if you're not a new man or a new woman, you're, in the life that you're living, your life is denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Gird up your loins with truth. It's going, to cut, it's going to lead to a changed life when you start doing the work of the Lord. You grow up your loins for two purposes. The work of the Lord, and after a while, when God's done a lot of work on you, you're going to start realizing there's times where you can fight for the Lord. Amen. From day one, you can fight, saying, this is God's perfect written word. I'm not mo moving. You can't make me move. It's the book above all books, because it's the one true book Amen. of God's word. Perfect, without error, mm -hmm. no mistakes. That's another red flag when you have somebody who keeps trying to find mistakes and you answer it and then they'll try to find another mistake and then you answer that and they'll try to find another mistake. And that, you're not dealing with someone who's saved when they're purposely trying to find mistakes. 
The difference when someone comes to you and says, I don't get this. And look, this says this here, and this says this over here. I don't get it. I've had that question before and had to ask some brothers in Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you have someone saying, see this? It's a contradiction. See this? This is an error. See this? That's, a, that's not someone who's saved. Okay. But we do it for work. When you grow up your loins, it's for work and, the, and fighting for the Word. And for the Lord Jesus Christ. Capital W Word. Uh, Philippians 1.27 Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I might hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're all supposed to be of one mind. Brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, the gospel is simple. And the Bible says that for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. I will never, ever, and I know there's a lot of you brothers and sisters in Christ out there the same way, I will never, ever regret repenting and letting God come into my life and give me a new life and change my life. I will never look back at that old man and say, man, I wish, yeah, man, I don't know, if, I wish I kept that old man. And no, I would never do that. And I know, brothers and sisters in Christ, you out there that are truly saved and born again, you would never do that either. Okay? We're supposed to be of one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. True love for Jesus Christ is doing your best. Your heartfelt desire is to please God and to obey His Word. And when you fail, that heartfelt desire is there. Because I said repentance starts before salvation and continues. I say before, you can say at salvation. Because it all happens at once. It starts there and keeps going. That heart felt still there. So when you do fail the Lord, your heart, you just feel miserable. You feel miserable. You start to hate yourself. You start to beat yourself up because you failed the Lord. Okay? That sorrow is there again. And you repent. Okay? But repentance is there. Repent. Believe. In the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And when God saves you, he gives you a new life. I don't. I mean, ever since God saved me and changed my life, I can't see how anybody would fight that. And after a while, God, when you, like I said, when you're new, you're girding up your loins and you start doing the work of the Lord by doing the studying and He starts changing your life. You look at people who attack it and you're like, I can't see why they would attack it. The Lord is doing amazing in my life. He's changed my life. I'm His. I belong to Him. I am in Him and He is in me. But then after a while, when you go out to start doing the fighting for the Lord, you start realizing, oh, that's why they fight it. Because they don't want to change life. They want sin for a season. They love their sin more than they love Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what that whole passage is about. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable disobedient uh, and unto every good work reprobate some things they'll do is good it lines up with scripture some things they say might line up with scripture but it's reprobate because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them okay. and all, most of the time when they say something that lines up with scripture it goes back to what I've always taught brothers and sisters of Christ PWC what's that? Polly want a cracker they're just repeating someone who is saved that did a teaching, and they're just repeating it. So that's how they can come across sometimes saying things that line up. Not that because it, it came from their heart, it's because they're just parroting what somebody else said. Now the other thing to learn from here, it says, be, uh, be, uh, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. The lost world turns on one another. A lot of the people, the enemy, they, they'll turn on one another. Uh, you'll see that when, they, when there's nothing for them to fight me about, they'll fight amongst each other. If they have nothing to fight Brother Brian about, they'll fight amongst each other. 
uh, Brother JT, uh, Brother Aaron uh, Deering, and so on and so forth. Brad Abershine, if I'm saying it right. Um, Cannibal KJV, I think, is his, his YouTube. Um, when they're not t fighting us, they're fighting each other. And brothers and sisters of Christ, there's times where we fall into the trap of fighting each other. Okay? We're supposed to correct one another. When I go to correct a brother in Christ, I say, here's the word of God, take it or leave it, and then I step back and let God deal with them. The Bible says we're supposed to go to him one-on-one, -on -one, then you're supposed to take a second person when he's wronged you, or he's, it, he's living in sin, you're going to correct him. Then you have the whole church speak to him, and if he didn't, refuses to hear the church, then he's to be treated as a heathen and a publican. I can't remember if that was Matthew 8, I think it is. But we're supposed to strive together, okay? The lost world fights among themselves. They'll turn on each, self, on each other. When they see blood, they'll turn on each other. We're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be of one mind. I've always preached that there's, like I said, everybody always says that I agree with Brother Brian on everything. No, I don't. I believe, according to Scripture, there's no teaching that, you cannot teach that there are things that we can agree to disagree on and back it by Scripture because you won't find it in Scripture. Okay? The Bible says time and time again we're supposed to be of one mind striving together. One spirit, one mind. Also it talks about in the Bible being one body. Okay? There's only one Jesus. One perfect written word of God in English. We're supposed to be of one mind. Okay? So when we're standing for truth, it goes back to the backbiting stuff, you know. Don't fall into the trap of the backbiting, especially among brethren. Okay, there's some things that's worth. Uh, uh, there's times where I'll watch a study and be okay. It was a good study, but I disagree with them in five areas. There's sometimes where it's worth mentioning those five areas, and then there's sometimes where maybe it's just at that point in time it's just not worth mentioning it right now. Okay, you don't always have to say every time you disagree about every little thing. Okay, and then there's times where God will put it on your heart where you used to believe that, and then He showed you something, and you share it with that brother in Christ or sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. See, Second Corinthians six fourteen. Turn to Second Corinthians six fourteen. When you gird up your loins with truth, and you start putting on the rest of the pieces of the armor. A soldier is supposed to hang out with his own soldiers. You do not go over and hang out with the enemy. And you don't you let the enemy come in, and you don't go over and fellowship with the enemy. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. People cry say this is only about marriage. It says unbelievers, plural. And where does it say marriage in that whole chapter? But my biggest thing to disprove is simply that. It says unbelievers, plural. Are you allowed to have more than one wife? More than one husband? No. So this is talking about the world as a whole. Okay? Be not yet unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay? Remember Matthew, it was Matthew 18, not 8, but Matthew 18. Verse 17 says, And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. I did a teaching way back when about, is there is sin justification to break fellowship? And it is. Okay, there's a time where you do treat someone who is saved, you believe they're saved in your heart, but you're to treat them as if he's lost. In other words, you break fellowship with them. But you're not to fellowship with the lost world. Think of this scenario. You're girding up your loins. You've got a post. You stand here. Here comes the enemy wanting to come over. Oh, come on over. Let's talk. Let's talk. You start talking and you're having a good time. And another enemy. Another enemy. 
and after a while, next thing you know, you realize, where's my shield at? It's missing. Where's my sword at? It's missing. My hat was on my head. How, how did my hat get off my head? Where's my hat? The helmet of salvation? You see what I'm saying? They start coming in. They start distracting you. They start getting you to take off the armor of God. They start to get you to do things you're not supposed to do. They start to get you to doubt the word of God. That's why the shield of faith is missing. They start getting you to doubt the word of God. You don't allow men, period. You stand your post. They're the enemy. You stay away. I will not fellowship with you. Amen. When you stand for the word of God, you start doing the work of the Lord, you start doing the study in your life, and you start standing, part of standing for the word of God and suffering for Jesus Christ is, in your life, you're going to realize it gets very really lonely. And you feel very isolated sometimes because you start, a lot of people get, you, I'm not saying you can't, spend time with lost people like I have a daughter that's lost, I have a mom that's lost, I have fam brothers that are lost, I have neighbors that are lost that I go over and I help them out with something. This is talking about fellowship. And there's times, there's a lot of times with neighbors I won't hang out with them. I get invited over to parties where they're playing, blaring all kinds of satanic style music, they got alcohol and wine and I won't have anything to do with that. I, I, I turn them down, I won't. But when they're not throwing the parties, they'll ask, hey, I need help with this. I'll go over and help them out with something, moving something. And there's times where God has opened a door and I was able to talk to him about Jesus Christ. Okay? There's a difference. But that war is there. You don't fellowship with the lost world and you don't indulge in the sins of the lost world. We read that verse that those who take pleasure in them that do them. Okay? Whether you're doing them or you're watching and taking pleasure in them that are doing them, you're just as guilty. Okay? Be very careful. But you're not supposed to fellowship. When you invite uh, lost people in, that's when you realize, today I believe that the Lord is weeding out a lot of lot false converts uh, that are trying to weasel their way in, trying to sneak their way into the body of Christ. I understand that. But when they do come in, if you ever looked at some of the times in the Bible, uh, the group that you know they say we're a part of, but the, the fellowship that we have, King James Vail Ministries, uh, Brother JT, um, Aaron Deering, and stuff. When you see that there's a lot of problems happening with within this, the the brethren, the comment section, the brothers and sisters in Christ, we find out that it's because somebody has slithered their way in and tried to pretend to be a Christian. They come in being all nice, and then they try to draw away disciples after them. When they get caught, when they get called out, or when they think the time is right, they try to draw away disciples after them, and they start causing problems because when you let lost people into your fellowship they will mess you up they will ruin the fellowship among the brethren mm -hmm. so when you're going to stand and do the work of God and you're going to be a soldier for Jesus Christ and your loins are girt about with truth you don't invite the enemy over and you don't go out and hang out with the enemy you don't go over there and hang out with the enemy okay you stand your ground you stand your post 1 Thessalonians 3.1 Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. They sent somebody who was a proved Proved himself, who is a proved, a saved man with all the armor of God on, they sent him over there. Comfort you concerning the faith that no man should move, be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. You're going to suffer sometimes as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Actually, you're going to, in these last days, there's going to be a lot of suffering. One of the things is loneliness, isolation, losing friends when you get saved. You're going to lose friends, family members. Okay? You can, it can even get so bad as you can lose a wife, you can lose a, uh, a husband, you can lose a son, you can lose a daughter. You know, you can be yelled at, you can be spit at, you can be, you know, disowned. You know, if I'm trying to think of some of the other words where it's like you're dead to them. You know, even as it, even as it came to pass and you know, 
you can lose jobs. I forgot to add in too. Financially, you can have hard times. You can lose jobs because you're standing for the word of God and everything. There's a lot of suffering that's going on today among the body of Christ. Verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Are they still standing? Are they fainted? Have they faltered? Have they fallen flat on their face? Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. If. There's the Bible word. If. Bible condition. <laughs> you stand fast. Stand, stand. One thing here, as a soldier, when I start getting down as a soldier, you know what really lifts my spirit up? Fellowshipping with some of the brethren. You know, talking about the Word of God, learning about the Word of God, praying for one another, helping, even just helping out a brother in Christ lifts my spirits. Mm -hmm. Physically or financially, you help people out, a brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. When you someone gets saved, that lifts my heart. But when you see somebody that has fallen get back up and pick up that cross and get back to serving the Lord, that gives you... Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for helping them. And that knows that I can do it. We can do all things through Christ with strength in us. Okay? But it's always good to see the example. When you see someone else do it, the Lord helped him. The Lord can help me. The Lord helped her. The Lord can help me. You know? It's a good thing to stand by one another and help one another. But like I said, there's times where I just feel completely lonely. I've just... Uh, and you get to... Uh, just feeling bad, but then I get an email from a brother in Christ, or Skype from a brother in Christ, and it really lifts my spirits to know that we're both serving the Lord. Sometimes we're both going through the same struggles, and we're praying for one another. Mm -hmm. Standing for the truth is not just in words, though. Okay, uh, that's the biggest thing I've always pushed. People always—it's it's not just words anymore. I know my ministry started out with words have meaning, but after a while it came to that verse where it says that whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It got to the point where I need to push this all the time. It's not just in words. Their actions need to back it up. Okay? Standing for truth is not just in words, but word and deed. You, can, you cannot stand for truth if you are not living truth. Remember, loving Jesus Christ is an act of your will. It's an action. It's not just words saying, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. It's an action. And I've always pushed this. I've compromised. I've been deceived before because I took people at their word. There needs to be action to back it up. When someone says, I'm a Christian, they need to prove it. The Bible even says so. Prove your own selves. Know your own selves that you be... Oh, gosh, I can't remember that one. But... um. Let me see if I can find it over here. But prove your own selves. Time and time again, the Bible says you need to prove yourselves and you need to be approved. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except except you be reprobates. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny and being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. Okay? Prove your own selves. It's not just words. They don't just say I'm a Christian. They need to prove it. They don't just say I'm a Bible believer. They need to prove it. Someone can say I'm a Bible believer, but the next thing you know, they get you doubt in the Bible. Well, what about this mistake over here? What about that mistake over here? This contradicts with this over here. This probably shouldn't be here. And, and this, you know. But they say they're a Bible believer, but is that the actions of a Bible believer? They go looking for mistakes? And they always, instead of saying, hey, this says this here, this says this over here, Lord, and pray to the Lord, say, help me reconcile it. 
That's not their attitude, it's a contradiction. Look at this contradiction over here. Look. People say, well, I'm a Christian, a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, and there's no changed life. Well, I believe in the true plan of salvation. Okay, you believe in the changed life gospel. I call it the changed life gospel. It's the gospel that leads to a new life. The new, walking new in newness of life. A new creature. A new man. A new woman. That is in the Bible. You know what I mean? Uh, oh, I don't believe that. Then it starts to come, to, the truth starts to come to life when you start drilling them and, and looking at their life, their actions, and start holding them accountable to their actions. Then their words start to change. But at first, the words can say something that lines up and seems like truth, but their actions say another word. Okay? The whole thing about do as I say, not as I do, being a hypocrite. But a lot of people do will say something just to get into the group. I've known people like that. Okay? Next, uh, living truth. Live the truth. 